Turn your Bibles this, this afternoon to Acts chapter 5. We'll pick up the reading in verse number 17. If you can, please stand as we read just a handful of verses, a few verses. Brother Danny Hope preached the second half of this scene yesterday, and I want to focus mainly on the first half of this scene in Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse number 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, and brought them forth, and said, Go stand and speak in the temple of the people, to the people of all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning, and taught. Let's pray. Our Father, in your Son's precious name, Jesus Christ, I come before your throne so thankful for the opportunity to preach and so baffled why you would call me to preach. I pray, Father, that I am faithful to the text, that I don't take any unnecessary liberties, and I pray that you've given your people ears to hear this sermon this afternoon. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There is some background to this text that I think should be mentioned before diving into this text. The apostles Peter and John had already stood before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin would be Israel's supreme court for religious matters. And in that epic court case, the Sanhedrin's verdict was clear and unmistakable. The apostles, disciples of Jesus Christ, and the church that belonged to Jesus in Jerusalem was forbidden to speak or teach in the name of Jesus Christ. They were not to utter the name of Jesus Christ. It would be religiously unconstitutional for anyone to speak the name of Jesus. Now, the basis of this decision is probably twofold. First, Peter's testimony in the court case. He testified in Acts chapter 4, verse number 12, that there's, no other, that there's no name under heaven given among men whereby we, we must be saved. It is just the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the key that unlocks the door of salvation. What's sad today in our society and in our culture is, is our gospel preaching is more focused on felt needs than it is Jesus Christ. Amen. The man before me folk mentioned how we are so into programs and, and activities, and I'm not opposed to programs and activities. But it seems that programs and activities for our kids have become a God in and of themselves. They should be more focused on, is the name of Jesus Christ being preached and proclaimed through the sermons that are being preached? Amen. The second reason the Sanhedrin came to this decision was, everything this church did, they did in the name of Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, they baptized in the name of Jesus. In Acts chapter 3, verse 6, they healed in the name of Jesus. In Acts chapter 4, verse 10, all the authority that they claimed to have came through the name of Jesus. And a little bit later, in Acts chapter 4, verse 30, all the signs and wonders they did, they did in the name of Jesus. So it's not too hard to figure out why the Sanhedrin came up with this verdict that you cannot speak or teach in the name of Jesus. They were hoping that this verdict would squash this amazing divine operation that was happening in Jerusalem. It's amazing how our society, not just the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin is a microcosm of our society, how they're fearful of the name of Jesus. How they've excluded the name of Jesus from public discourse. The burden is on us to proclaim the name of Jesus whenever we have an opportunity. Amen. Years ago, this would have been the spring of 2002, uh, the church I went to is the Went Place Baptist Church. We had a school back then, and the seniors wanted to go to New York City for the senior trip right after 9-11. While there, we visited uh, Good Morning America, the most boring four hours of my entire life. <laughs> At the end of the show... Charlie Gibson and, the, and, and, and his crew came down to meet the audience. They were planning on doing a series of trips to odd names in America, odd town names. One of the odd town names they were planning to visit was Hell, Michigan. Remember that, Brother Head? And of all the people Charlie Gibson interviewed, it was my pastor. And my pastor says, 
uh, Charlie Gibson asked my pastor, he says, hey, what's your name? Joe Head. Where are you from? Cincinnati, Ohio. And Charlie Gibson asked my pastor, if I came to your city, where would you take me? And I will never forget what my pastor said. Instead of hell, I'll take you to a little heaven on earth, the Wenton Place Baptist Church, where, a name, where the name of Jesus Christ is proclaimed. Now, I'm not going to tell you, well, maybe I should tell you what happened afterwards. Charlie Gibson quickly looked at his stomach and said, it seems like you might take me somewhere else, like Skyline Chili, right? But I was impressed with my pastor because he didn't have to think about it. Amen. It just came. Amen. And it came because the name of Jesus Christ is important to my pastor. Right. So important that it's just a part of who he is. Amen. And it's where I need to be in every aspect of my life so that when I'm thrust in an impromptu situation, the name of Jesus Christ comes out. Amen. There's saving power in the name of Jesus Christ. There's authority in the name of Jesus Christ. And no matter what our society wants to do to squash and to expel the name of Jesus Christ, as I mentioned just a few moments back, it's our burden. It's our debt to the world to preach the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As clear and unmistakable as the Sanhedrin's verdict was, Peter and John's reply was equally clear and unmistakable. In Acts chapter 4, verse number 19, Peter and John says, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than God, judge ye. What was amazing about this response was, what had the most weight for Peter and John wasn't the Sanhedrin's verdict. It was the commission that Jesus gave them. In the Old Testament, there are a number of Hebrew words that are translated glory. One of the words that's translated glory in the Old Testament means weight. The idea behind that is whoever has the most weight will carry the influence for the day. And in this way, Peter and John displayed and proclaimed that God's glory rested in their words because God's weight way ruled the day. God's weight controlled their decisions. They weren't focused on the weight of the Sanhedrin. They were focused on a far superior weight, the weight of God and his commission. The second thing to point out is, is there had been a transformation in Peter's life. It was just a few weeks before this, if you remember, Peter, in a very toxic environment, was busy denying Christ three times. And yet here, in Acts chapter 4, he's defending the name of Jesus Christ before arguably a more authoritative crowd than before. A, a group of people that had the power to determine his fate. What happened to Peter? Why the transformation? Well, in the Gospels of Jesus Christ, Peter was more focused on his vision for Jesus on his plans for Jesus. But in the Acts of the Apostles, we find that Peter was more invested in God's vision for Jesus Amen. and God's plan for his life. And so before this court hearing took place, Luke records how that Peter had yielded himself to God and therefore was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And it doesn't matter, brothers and sisters, how much <clears throat> we have, how much strength we have, how much energy we have, it doesn't matter how vocal we may be. We need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Amen. We need to yield ourselves to God in all aspects so that God's Spirit will come and not just be a part of who we are, but fill us and influence our decisions within the ministries that God has given us. Amen. So the Sanhedrin, after giving the verdict, they let these two men go. And these two men went to one place, Luke says back to their own company. The church was special. And after they went back to their own company, they gave the details as to what had happened in the temple and before the Sanhedrin. After that, they prayed. One of the missing elements today in our churches, I believe, is corporate prayer. Yeah. Oftentimes when people pray in a corporate setting, it, they're canned prayers. I remember my pastor saying this all the time in, in the 20 years that he had pastored went place. He is sick and tired of the canned prayers that we give in our corporate worship. And yet we continue to give those canned prayers. 
Part of the issue, I believe, is we're afraid to be vulnerable in front of other people. When you examine the prayer request of this church, there was enormous vulnerability. Even after they had preached in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, and Acts chapter 4, their two prayer requests was, one, we need boldness to continue to preach the word of truth. They understood their weakness. They knew that in and of themselves, they weren't strong. I appreciate a that man's uh, sermon last night, I don't remember your name, Fulton, maybe? White? Something. I didn't know my wife's last name until we married her, until she married me, right? So it just is what it is. Sorry, don't be offended by it. I'll probably know all of your names when we get to glory. But he preached an amazing sermon on the gospel. But if we're honest, there are times when we're fearful may be intimidated to preach the gospel. It isn't unusual. You're not alone. You're not on an island thinking that, wait a minute, am I not right with God? But it is during these times we do need to pray, God, please give us boldness from this divine boldness so that we can clearly and powerfully proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ that has the power to shift the person from dead in their trespasses and sins to alive in Jesus Christ. Amen. And so often we forget the power's there. And we are convinced by Satan's lies that we're powerless and we're ineffective in telling others about Jesus. Not only did they pray that God would give them boldness, but they also prayed, God, please give us signs and wonders to authenticate the word of God that's being preached, to be the foundation so the word of God can be preached. And in these signs and wonders, three things happened in Israel. First, a lot of Jews were fearful to even be a part of this church, especially after Ananias and Sapphira's death. Second, there were some who did grow, uh, move and became members of the church at Jerusalem, but it just pointed to that this church's growth was pure. They weren't joining the church unless they were for sure saved and ready to serve the king. But there's a third thing, really a phenomenon. People from all over Israel, all four points of Israel, north, south, east, and west, they came to Jerusalem because they heard the healing powers of the apostles, and they wanted their loved ones to be healed. In this enormous extravaganza of signs and wonders, the apostles were able to declare the name of Jesus in the healing, but keep in mind, they used the signs and wonders as a foundation, as an authenticator, so that they can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So not only were people being healed, but they were hearing the amazing story of the life of Jesus. Amen. Now the beauty of this is, is the Sanhedrin ruled that they could not teach or speak in the name of Jesus, and yet through the signs and wonders that God gave to the apostles, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the name of Jesus Christ was being, uh, had extended through all of Israel because people from all parts of Israel came to Jerusalem. Yeah, An amazing story. And this is where we find ourselves in Acts chapter 5 and in verse 17 where the Bible says the high priest rose up and all they that were with him, which is of the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. Now keep in mind the Sanhedrin that I just mentioned a few moments back, there were 70 men, made up of three classes of people, rulers, elders, and scribes. The person who led this group would have been the high priest. The high priest would have been a Sadducee. Most of the Sanhedrin's Sanhedrin would have been Sadducean. Now, the Sadducees, they were, if you thought the Pharisees were awful in the Gospels, the Sadducees were more awful. They only believed in the first five books of the Bible. They didn't believe in Satan. They didn't believe in hell. They didn't believe in angels. And they didn't believe in the resurrection. The reason Luke starts with the high priest and the Sadducees was because they controlled two-thirds of the Sanhedrin. So they controlled the narrative. They controlled the vote. They controlled who stood before them and who didn't stand before them. 
And so Luke starts with the genesis of, of the Sanhedrin's power. And the Sanhedrin, starting with the chief, the high priest and the Sadducees, they're angry. In fact, Luke says they're filled with indignation. That word indignation means fiery, red, hot, passionate. It's the same word that Luke uh, mentions in Acts chapter 13 regarding Paul and Barnabas' ministry, how the Jews were envious of their success. But the word here speaks to something more than envy. To be sure, they were envious. After all, who, which high priest wouldn't rather have their name proclaimed throughout Jerusalem instead of the name of Jesus? And surely the Sanhedrin would have wanted the signs and wonders, them being able to do the signs and wonders instead of the apostles. So there would have been some envy. But it seems here that this word really carries the idea of being religiously motivated to rage. They hated the name of Jesus. They hated the name of Jesus so much they wouldn't even utter the name of Jesus in public discourse. Just a few verses down, the apostles are standing before the Sanhedrin. In verse number 28, here Luke records the charges against these apostles. Notice what the Sanhedrin said. Did not we straightly commend you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us? They just couldn't even mention the name of Jesus. I'm a sports fan. I love sports, baseball, basketball, football. I'm from Ohio, so I'm a huge Ohio State Buckeye fan. Amen. The Buckeyes, their chief rival, comes from the state up north. Yeah. The rivalry is so intense, and in a sports sense, there's hatred between the two schools that a good Ohio State Buckeye fan will never utter that state's name. <laughs> Ever. This isn't a sports event. This is real life. Yeah. And the intensity on which the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin as a whole, hated Jesus, could be felt as they refused to even mention the name of Jesus. They hated this name. They were filled with this anger. And I mentioned this before, but whenever you're filled with something, that will control and influence your decisions. And so with this anger that they had, that they were filled with, they were left with only one option, and that was to arrest the 12 apostles. So they arrested these men, and they brought them in the common prison. They even set guards, not just one guard. There was a plurality of guards there that they set, and the idea was they would try them the very next morning. That's always the world's answer. But I am thankful more than thankful that God has the final answer. Amen. That God has the final say-so. It doesn't matter what the world does. God always has the final say-so. Notice how the story continues in verse number 18. And they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. I love, I love de debates. I, I enjoy theological debates, listening to them, honestly. Usually what happens in a theological debate is you have a proposition. You have one person that affirms the proposition and another person that rebuts the proposition. If this was a debate, the, same, the, the proposition would have been pro prohibiting the name of Jesus Christ from being preached. Those affirming it would have been the Sanhedrin. The rebutter would have been God. Now the Sanhedrin would have affirmed it because, well, they were losing power as the gospel of Jesus Christ was being preached. Never forget what Jesus said in John's gospel, chapter 8, verses 32 and 36, that when you know the truth, the truth makes you free. As the gospel was being preached, God was delivering lost people who were under the control of the Sanhedrin in darkness into light and being un under the control of the Holy Spirit. They were losing power. They were losing authority. They were losing their influence. And so that's the reason, the reason they gave. We affirm that the name of Jesus cannot be preached. But God 
said, but. If but is associated with you and me, it doesn't mean much of anything. But whenever but is associated with God, it's always a dynamic, eternal, divine game changer. I mean, don't forget the story in Genesis chapter 50 and verse number 20, right? When Jacob had already passed and Jacob's uh, sons, 11 of his sons, they were really worried what Joseph might do to them. And, and so they come to Joseph really just begging for mercy. And if you remember what Joseph said, he said, you meant it for evil, but God Amen. meant it for good. Amen. What gives us hope in a dark world is but God. Amen. See, nothing happens without God's approval. No matter how sinister or how good it is, nothing happens without God's approval. And in Acts chapter 5, God's approval was to remand the decision made by the Sanhedrin. What's funny is this. When you read verse 19, but the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, what's funny is the very being that the Sanhedrin, most of the Sanhedrin disputed even existed. God used that being, that, an angel, to unlock the prison doors. I think it's funny. You know, when I look at it, it's just God does have a sense of humor. He could have just opened the doors. No, he sent an angel that the high priest and the Sadducees dispute even existed. But yet, honestly, if we think about it, we see this throughout the, the history of Christianity. So he frees them. Let me just make a note here. God doesn't always free us. Stephen wasn't freed. James, the brother John, became the first apostle to become a martyr. In fact, church history says all of the apostles, with maybe the exception of John, died of martyrdom. If you read the Fox Book of Martyrs, thousands upon thousands, maybe millions upon millions, they didn't have this miraculous release. But whenever God does liberate, and whenever God does free, and whenever God does in a divine way give us a reprieve, he does so with a purpose. It isn't just so that we can be free from the prison cell. It isn't just so that we can be healed of cancer. It isn't just so that we can get our family back in order. There's always a purpose with God. I'm reminded of what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, how that we are called according to his purpose. God has a purpose for our life. And even in Acts chapter 5, when the angel of the Lord was sent by God to unlock this prison cell, to let the apostles out, he didn't do so without any cause. There was a purpose in mind, and that purpose the angel of the Lord had the message that he had from the Lord was, you need to go into the temple, the headquarters of darkness in Israel, where the gates of hell were for the Israelites, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So they were free, but free with a burden. Yes. Years ago, I read a sermon, I forget it's in a book, and I forget the author of the book, but Baptist debt to the world. The first time I read it probably was in the early 90s. I thought that was the strangest sermon title ever. If anything, they owe us, is my thinking. But after reading that sermon, it changed how I looked at life. We have a burden, and we have a debt. Years ago, there's this lady. She was born in Bulgaria. Her pastor, her parents were Christians. She was a Christian. Um, Bulgaria was communism at the time, and they really, they hated Christianity. And this woman named Margaret Nicole, her mom and dad had already been put to death. And, and probably one of the reasons she wasn't put to death was because she was an expert violinist. And she would go from concert place to concert place because she was that good. In between, she did suffer some persecution because of her faith. One particular event was in Vienna. 
the Soviet Union refused to let her go because, well, Vienna wasn't under their control. To make a long story short, God moved even against the Soviet Union. And she made it to Vienna. She apl applied for political asylum. Uh, the United States took her in. After she got to America, she was there for two weeks. She was visiting this church, and this family really was just broken over this young lady's testimony. And, and this, this couple went to this lady and asked, is there anything we can get you for Christmas? Christmas was just two weeks down the road. She said, well, I would like to have a Bible. Just stunned this couple. Well, we can go to a bookstore. There are Bibles everywhere. But she went to the genesis of why she wanted a Bible. In Bulgaria, the, the communists came in, and they took all the Bibles that people owned. So there's this one lady in the church. As the communists came into her house to take all the Bibles in that house, she hid the Bible under her lap. Because of God's providence, the soldiers didn't look under her body. The next Lord's Day, she took that Bible to church, and she just started ripping out pages and giving them to people. She had two pages, maybe one page, front and back of God's Word for a decade. She said in her testimony, I'm glad it wasn't numbers. <laughs> it was the part where God, in Genesis, where God gave Abraham promises. She was free. But with that freedom, there's this burden that God placed upon her. She knew she couldn't preach. She was a lady. But what she wanted to do was to spearhead a movement to get Bibles into Bulgaria. And in the end, God would use her to bring 10,000 Bibles into Bulgaria to give to pastors who have only had handwritten parts of Scripture to preach for years. I bring this up to say that freedom that she had had, came with a burden. Let me close with this. Brothers and sisters, you could have been born anywhere in this world. Yes. Do you know that? You could have been born in Saudi Arabia. You could have been born in the Soviet Union. You could have been born in Cuba. You could have been born in Iran. You could have been born in Syria. You could have been born in a number of places where the gospel of Jesus Christ was or is forbidden to be preached. But you were born in America where there's a church on every street corner. And even at that, there are so many people in our country that have never heard the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, they've heard the false gospel, but never the true gospel. And yet, in God's providence, whether you came from a good home or a broken home, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the biblical gospel of Jesus Christ, intersected your life. And now you're saved. You don't deserve it. You didn't deserve it any more than me. But with this liberation, with this emancipation that God declared on our lives comes a burden, a responsibility. Amen. That burden and responsibility is to declare the truth of God's word and whatever ministry God calls us to do. I do know this. God never calls church members to be pew ministry people. He calls us to move. Amen. Years ago, when my pastor was teaching a class, I think on homiletics, we listened to this video of, of a man who was preaching on the Great Commission. And this man, as he preached on the Great Commission, he said, the hardest two-letter word in the English vocabulary for Baptists is go. Mm -hmm. One day, we're not going to have this freedom. You can see it, right? It doesn't matter how the next presidential election turns out. It's just a matter of time. It just is. Let's not wait till we lose the freedom to get busy and serious about God. I'm kind of a glass half full kind of a guy. I'm still praying for revival. I want God to rescue this nation. 
I'm really like Habakkuk. Lord, please send a revival. But we'll be content as Habakkuk was at the end with whatever God decides to do. But what I don't want to be is on the sidelines waiting on God to act in wrath when I could have been in the time of mercy preaching the truth of the gospel. Amen. And so I just want to encourage you, exhort you, maybe rebuke you if that's where you're at. Life is short. I'm 53. My brother, my pastor, I don't know, he's probably 80. I don't know. I just know now he has a cardiologist. So that means you have to be up there in age. But it doesn't matter if you're 53, 63, or 83. I think when you're old, older, you can see how life how fast life is. You're not guaranteed the same abilities tomorrow that you have today. And part, I think, that's the reason we find the text that says, redeem the time. And I want to encourage you to redeem the time that God's given you and pray that I will redeem the time that God has given me. People have asked how upstate New York is. It's no different than here. Just wickedness. And a lot of apathy amongst church people. But I will say this, that whatever degree of wickedness is in upstate New York, it's moving its way west. Someone asked me, in my county, there are, in my county, there are more people, I'm not re referencing just the Lord's Church, I'm referencing all the churches. There are more people who pastor in my county that are either gay, lesbian, that are female or transgender than there are just straight males. It's coming. But God. And he uses you for the but God.